delivering today the iPad, the new iMac, the iPod, iPhoto, MacBook Air, iTunes. It's a revolutionary mobile. He's one of the most creative and daring CEOs. A global icon who has shaped the worlds of technology and media. His products are adored by millions. The company he started in a garage is worth more than $200 billion today. It's an incredible talent he has for getting people to hear what he says and get excited about it. For over 30 years, computers, music, movies, and mobile phones have all been transformed by Apple's Steve Jobs. He's been called a brilliant visionary. He's the Thomas Edison of our time. And an egocentric bully. He drove them overly hard at certain times. Some of them just wound up just quitting in disgust. Some of them wound up saying they'd never work for Steve again. Few executives in history have suffered such painful setbacks. It looked like Jobs was, was washed up, was a total has-been. Or as much success. Steve, I love you! And Steve came back and, and began what I think is the greatest turnaround in the history of corporate America. One of the challenges of understanding Steve Jobs is that he has a different operating system from mere mortals. So mere mortals trying to understand what goes on in Steve Jobs' brain, it would be like explaining to a fish what it is to fly. Yeah, he's a fascinating bundle of contradictions. So influential, yet so secretive. Uh, you know, he's incomparable. There's no one like him. A very remarkable man. Extremely smart. A spellbinding, mesmerizing leader of people. Jobs went from having nearly blown this amazing fortune and bankrupted himself to arising as a billionaire with a brilliant future. Jobs' rise to technology superstar propelled him into the public eye at a young age. Uh, what a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. The iPod mini. But while he'll take center stage to introduce new products, he shuns the spotlight when it's turned on him. He declined to participate in this program. It's a secrecy that has only served to deepen the mystery of what makes him tick. Because he's such a polarizing character, we have a tendency to try to freeze him and say, he's like this, when in fact, he's changed a lot. Jobs is a true son of Silicon Valley. Born in 1955 in San Francisco, he was raised in its freewheeling culture of experimentation and innovation. Alan Deutschman is an author who has written extensively about Jobs and Apple. Steve Jobs, from going back to when he was a teenager, was very influenced by the 1960s, 1970s counterculture. You know, he loved the Beatles, he loved Bob Dylan. He enrolled in Oregon's Reed College, but dropped out his freshman year. Daniel Kotke was a college friend of Jobs. I think by the time he was a freshman in college, Steve already had a sense that there were great opportunities in the world and that he wasn't really going to need his college credits. Robert X. Cringely was Apple computer employee number 12. When I met him, he was, I think, 19 years old. He, he had hair down to his waist and he only ate fruit. And he was, you know, clearly a hippie. When Jobs returned to his childhood home in California, he became interested in what was then an entirely new concept, the personal computer. A revolution was brewing in this hall rented from Stanford University. A group of eccentric enthusiasts and inventors called themselves the Homebrew Computer Club. They were about to ignite a new industry. Jobs joined meetings with a man who would become his partner in founding Apple Computer, Steve Wozniak. People were getting up, these computers are going to revolutionize life. And I felt like, oh my God, I'm a part of this huge revolution that we're talking about everybody's going to have a computer in the home and nobody in the outside world believes us. Steve Wozniak was the engineering genius. Jobs, the product empresario. He really wanted to make something in life. I don't to this day know a lot of what drove him that way, but he really wanted to have a company and a success. Projects that I would design and build very frequently, Steve would say he knew how to sell it. Jobs' family lived in this Los Altos neighborhood. He and Wozniak took time off their day jobs to set up shop in the family garage. 
We didn't have a telephone to phone the computer stores in the garage. That was in Steve's bedroom. The team's first computer, the Apple One. It was a circuit board that users would generally build into a makeshift wooden box. As the tech industry in Silicon Valley took off, Jobs saw opportunity. The penalty for failure uh, for going and trying to start a company in this valley is non-existent. There really isn't a penalty for failure either psychologically or economically in the sense that if you have a good idea and you go, go out to start your own company, even if you fail, you're generally considered worth more to the company you left because you've gained all this valuable experience in, in many disciplines. To bring their ideas to life, the Apple team needed capital. Jobs convinced angel investor Mike Markula to invest around $90,000 and a line of credit in the fledgling company. In exchange, Markula got one-third ownership and started a 20-year career with Apple Computer. It was exactly what they needed to create their new computer, the Apple II. It became the first highly successful mass-produced personal computer. What was revolutionary about the Apple II was its use of color, the fact it had a built-in keyboard, and it was the first one to look like a consumer device. And so it was a huge success, you know, it was astounding success right from the beginning. At 23, Jobs and the Apple team were soon making more money than they knew what to do with. Steve came to me one day and he said, you realize our stock is worth more than our parents have made in their lifetime. And I was stunned. What the heck? How can you have so much? And then... Six months later, you have ten times more. They were the stars of Silicon Valley and the cover boys for a new industry. Michael Moritz is a former Time magazine reporter and a legendary Silicon Valley venture capitalist. Inevitably, these companies aren't really companies at the beginning. They're a product. The next question was where do they go from here? Steve was always worried about competition from companies like IBM and everybody else in the world, and how are we going to avoid them? And you've got to stay out in the technology lead. There's always that sense of anxiety and tension associated with the question, how can we possibly follow this? In 1979, after a stock deal worth an undisclosed amount, Steve Jobs was allowed access to what was known as the treasure trove of Silicon Valley. It was Xerox Park, the company's famed research and development laboratory. Jobs and his team saw the future here, the way computers would be used, including the use of graphics and a small device that had not yet been revealed to the outside world, a mouse. He saw it. He was just blown away. He thought, well, this is the future of computing. So he went back to Apple and grabbed people who he worked with there and said, you know, you've got to see this. And you'd see two programs at once, and I was stunned. And you'd see three programs at once, and I thought, oh, my God. Once you have this machine, you're never going to want to go back. It's a one-way door. Your computers are going to be this way, and you'll never go back. Leander Caney is the editor of the blog Cult of Mac and the author of the book Inside Steve's Brain. Xerox had invented the entire paradigm of modern computing, but they had no idea what they were sitting on. But Jobs did. He wanted to bring the graphical user interface to Apple Computer. But first, he had to deal with a power shift going on inside Apple. Although Jobs was the founder and creative force of Apple, the Apple Board of Directors wanted an experienced executive to be president of the company. Jobs interviewed dozens of candidates before he focused on someone from outside the tech world, Pepsi CEO John Scully. I wasn't really interested in uh, joining Apple or being the CEO of Apple. I thought I was highly unqualified. But Steve, in those days, he had long black hair and very piercing palmetto berry eyes. He looked down at his running shoes, and then he looked up at me. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And it was like someone just knocked the wind out of my stomach. So he does have this incredible charismatic way of picking exactly the right thing to say at exactly the right moment and inspiring people like no one I've ever seen before. A few weeks later, I was working at Apple. For Apple Computer to thrive, they also needed another successful product. Jobs thought he had it in a powerful business computer called the Lisa. 
But the Apple board of directors still questioned his leadership and refused to give him the project. Steve expected it to be his. You know, it's his idea. We're going to do it. It's going to be mine. And they said, no, don't think so. By 1981, Steve Jobs was taken off Apple Computer's Lisa project. Steve was used to succeeding. Being uh, turned down to be the head of the Lisa division was his first personal failure. Even though he was chairman of the board and co-founder of the company, they said he wasn't experienced enough to run the Lisa team. And so he was unhappy about that. Jobs threw himself into another project, a computer created by Apple employee Jeff Raskin that would use similar technology but be available to consumers at a much lower price. He felt this would break open the market. Or rather, to characterize Steve's brain properly, or rather, the market ought to break open, you know, if the market had any sense. The project was named the Macintosh. He set up shop in an outlying building in the Apple complex and took a small team of Apple's best engineers with him. There was a black pirate flag flying on a mast on the front of the building. And this signified what Steve said was, we're the pirates and the Lisa team uh, were the Navy. Also during this time, the 29-year-old Jobs bought an historic mansion in pricey Woodside, California. The 17,000-foot Spanish mansion was considered by some in town to be a cultural landmark. He lived there as a kind of weird hermit recluse while developing the Mac, and it was famous for being um, completely empty of furniture. He slept on a bare mattress on the floor. Jobs' obsession was the Macintosh, and his intense drive began to take its toll on the Mac team. He was just impossible to work with. He just scared the bejesus out of people and wouldn't accept anything but the most amazing breakthroughs, which is impossible to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis. His standards just got higher and higher and higher and uh, people would bring him work to look at. It would be one o'clock in the, in the morning. Sometimes Steve said, I'm not even gonna look at it. And they said, well, Steve, I've worked on this thing for 25 hours. And he said, I know, but it's not good enough. You know, go back and work on it some more. Some of them just wound up um, just quitting in disgust. Some of them wound up saying they'd never worked for Steve again. They just couldn't. When the exhausted team finished, they had a revolutionary new computer. Many of us have been working on Macintosh for over two years now, and it has turned out insanely great. Guy Kawasaki was the software evangelist on the original Mac, and is now a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and venture capitalist. In like 60 seconds after I saw the demo of Macintosh, it was so cool. Angel started to sing, I mean, it was a beautiful experience. When you saw Macintosh for the first time, you have to put yourself back. It's 25 years ago now. That was a religious experience. This was supposed to be the computer that tamed the complexity of everything associated with the world of computing to make it available, as Steve would say, for mere mortals. It was a giant step into the future. It was extraordinary. What it wasn't was particularly useful, <laughs> but that didn't matter. The computer was beautiful, but had limited functionality. For the Macintosh to succeed, Jobs needed great software. He turned to another industry prodigy, Bill Gates. In the lead up to the Mac launch, the two pioneers appeared together at an Apple event. Microsoft had been writing software for the Mac for two years. Jobs didn't know that down the road, Bill Gates would become his main rival. For Jobs, the enemy was IBM and a PC that was taking over the market. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right? Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information. Jobs the underdog took aim at the giant with a spellbinding commercial. Everybody who was around at the time remembers the most memorable moment of the launch of the Macintosh, being the Ridley Scott commercial. There was this dark Orwellian vision of the future. It aired nationally only once, on Super Bowl Sunday in January of 1984, but the impact was explosive.
we estimated we got $45 million of free publicity of it being run over and over again by television networks all over the world because no one had ever seen a commercial like this before. I think everybody at the company was hoping and praying fervently that it would be a game changer. But it was dismissed by the high priests of computing as little more than a toy. And I think the sentiment within a year or so of the launch had turned very negative uh, about Apple and its future. 84, Steve Jobs and Apple Computer hoped the Macintosh would live up to its hype. But sales were a disappointment. And the IBM PC and PC compatible computers still dominated the market. Internally, trouble was brewing at Apple Computer. He ran amok at Apple. He cost the company a lot of money. So Steve was considered to be wasteful. He was considered to be self-indulgent. He was the largest shareholder, but also a kind of a brat. The thinking was, well, Macintosh had not penetrated business. We need a more mature leadership, some adult supervision to run the company. Tension in the company rose as an internal power struggle threatened to tear it apart. I said, Steve, we're a public company, and I have to tell the board where we are in terms of inventory, in terms of sales performance, and we're in trouble. And the trouble is in the Macintosh division. And he said, I don't believe you're going to do that. I don't think you have the nerve to do that. When he had reached the point where he identified Scully as a rival, he decided he had to take Scully out. So he engineered a boardroom confrontation where it's him or me. And much to Steve's surprise, the board sided with Scully. They said, Steve, we want your assurance that you're not going to leave Apple and take other people with us. We've heard rumors of that. And he said, no, absolutely not. And then the next day, Steve took five key managers and the board fired them. The knee-jerk reaction of conventional people is to elbow what they see as disruptive forces aside. And Steve, the co-founder of Apple, was unchivalrously ushered to the exit. Jobs was 30 years old. He sold all but one share of his Apple stock. For Steve, it was a, it was a statement. It's a vote of no confidence in the company. I'm out, therefore the company's going to fail. He being fired almost destroyed him. They threw him out of his own company. I mean, he thought it was unbelievable. Remember, Steve Jobs didn't just see himself as a business person. Uh, he saw himself as an artist. He saw himself as a revolutionary, someone who wanted to change the world. You know, I think there was a, a brief flirtation with the idea that Steve Jobs could go into politics, which, of course, looking back seems absurd because Steve Jobs is the, the least diplomatic person in the world. There were all kinds of uh, ideas, and it turned out that he wanted to go back and once again create the most insanely great computer in the world. Taking five top managers, in 1985, Jobs moved on to start a computer company called Next. For Jobs, it was about more than just creating a personal computer. It was about trying to reinvent the company. It was about creating the ideal work environment. It was about creating the ideal architectural environment. You know, Next had to be perfect in every way, something that would help change the world. Very modest ambitions. The product was powerful inside and out. A highly designed example of Jobs' perfectionism. The next machine was was beautiful. It had this, you know, black design. It was kind of like, you know, Darth Vader's computer. But Jobs struggled to find a market for the expensive computer. It was only a matter of time before Next was in trouble. At the time, you know, it was this incredible workstation and it's going to be a high price point. But if anything, Next also shows that lots of things have to fall in place. But Jobs did refine a business strategy he would use again and again. He learned at Next that he got a lot more attention by being secretive than he did by being open. And frankly, he didn't really have much to show. So being secretive made it appear that he had more than he really had. As Next burned through capital, Jobs faced a tough choice. Abandon the computer 
or face bankruptcy. Jobs always loved the computer as art object. It was a big deal when they realized that very few people were buying their hardware, but it turned out that their software was just breathtaking. The decision? Ditch the highly designed computer and focus instead on selling what makes it run, the company's elegant operating system. A thing you have to understand about Steve Jobs, he can be outrageously ambitious and idealistic, but he can also be practical when he has to, because this man is a survivor. I think that period during which he wandered in the wilderness was a period full of adversity. And I think people come back from adversity. If they can return from adversity, they come back harder, sharper, and far more geared for the five commencement address at Stanford University, Steve Jobs revealed for the first time some personal details about his early life. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. He was raised by parents who adopted him. They were blue collar, salt of the earth people. They were good parents, and, but they weren't intellectuals. They weren't artists, they weren't creative geniuses and Steve Jobs knew from early on that he was different. Later in life he discovered that his biological parents uh, were intellectuals and his biological sister she turned out to be a brilliant novelist Mona Simpson. In 1991 at age 36 Jobs started his own family when he married Laureen Powell. They have three children in addition to his daughter from a previous relationship. Jobs calls these years after Apple his most creative and personally fulfilling. His professional life was also changing dramatically. Another of his post-Apple computer business ventures was slowly coming to life. Right after his ouster from Apple, Jobs bought a company from Lucas Films that would become a household name. This little animation company called Pixar. He'd always sort of admired Hollywood, you know, from afar. Oh, I'd like to be a part of that somehow. So they hire an animator from Disney named John Lasseter, and they started making these very amusing one, two-minute films. You know, it was kind of like a demo. Well, it turns out that the films were wonderful, and not just from a technical standpoint, but creatively. In fact, the Pixar team had much bigger ambitions the creation of a full-length, fully computer-animated feature film. Their technology was now powerful enough to make it a possibility, and Hollywood was interested. Pixar made a deal with Disney uh, to work together to make a Toy Story. I actually had made the deal with them at the time. This is a gutsy guy. He came into uh, the movie business. His instincts were impeccable. Put his money up, his own personal money. He was on the line. In the decade after he left Apple, Steve Jobs nearly spent through his entire fortune. He nearly blew it all on both Next and Pixar, two struggling startups that were just losing money at an alarming rate. In 1995, Jobs' investment in Pixar was about to pay off in a big way. Toy Story. Pixar's first feature film was a blockbuster. I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. Oh, I'm so glad you're not a dinosaur! It earned $356 million worldwide and became 1995's highest grossing U.S. movie. Pixar, which uh, really created probably the most successful genre uh, in the movie business today, which is CG animation. It was an enormous success and based on the incredible performance of Toy Story uh, Pixar was able to go public which uh, wound up making Steve Jobs a billionaire it had been 10 years since he'd been fired from Apple 
and the drama and turmoil at the company continued to get worse. In a 1996 interview for the PBS series Triumph of the Nerds, Jobs' wounds were still apparent. He destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for, um, starting with me. Today, in a surprising admission, John Scully looks back on the Apple Board of Directors' decision to oust Jobs. In hindsight, um, I think they made the wrong choice. You know, they, they should have chosen Steve. The talent that Steve has is so extraordinary, we should have figured out how to, how to work with it. Scully's replacement, Michael Spindler, was also gone. And a third CEO, Gil Emilio, was struggling to keep the company afloat. Apple Computer was out of ideas and desperate. After Steve left the company, it lost its compass, lost its mission. It lost its founding spirit. Its products got old and stale. And during that whole period, Microsoft had gotten stronger and stronger. Computers running Windows accounted for nearly 80% of the market. Apple's market share could not break 11%. And their ousted co-founder was sitting on an operating system that could save them. This is why they ended up going back to Jobs, because they wanted Next's operating system. It's like the secret sauce is their springboard into all the future products. In an ironic and stunning turn of events, Apple Computer bought Next for over $400 million. We're going to be building our next generation operating system on Next technology. Selling Next to Apple, well, that's sheer genius. Uh, you, you just have to say, wow. Gil was sort of a victim of the time, you know. The board made a change again. Steve Jobs returned to the company he helped create and became interim CEO. And so there began what I think is the greatest turnaround in the history of corporate America. After a dozen years in exile, Steve Jobs returned to the company he co-founded. He just sensed the vacuum and moved in to fill it. The old juices started to flow. It was his finest hour, really, and he, he hauled ass and, and brought things back together again around a cohesive vision because he came in as the rainmaker. I don't think he for a moment deluded himself about the pickle that he inherited. We have all products, nobody's buying it, we've got declining market share, we don't have anything that's really exciting and interesting. Our cost structure is bloated, we're spending way too much money. We have a whole load of deadbeats inside of our company, the management isn't very good. He was really realistic. Jobs brought faith in his own vision, which meant simplifying and cutting Apple product lines. He called a big meeting in this big meeting room and he says, you know what's wrong with this company? And everyone's too scared to answer, no one will say anything. And he goes, the products suck. They've got no sex in them. Steve's point was, why are we selling digital cameras and printers? We're not adding anything special. You can buy better digital cameras from Canon or from printers from Hewlett Packard. So let's stop doing that. Let's just do the few things um, that we can do well. The comeback included a remarkable announcement. Bill Gates, who had long been considered Jobs' main rival, would invest in Apple Computer. Microsoft invested $150 million in Apple to help save the day. That must have been the low point for Apple. Uh, I happen to have a special guest with me today uh, via satellite downlink. And uh, if we could uh, get him up on the stage right now. We're very excited about the new release we're building. This is called Mac Office 98. Uh, we do expect to get it out by the end of this year. For some of, of the truly faithful, you know, it was like Luke Skywalker going to the evil empire and doing a deal with Darth Vader. We've kept our marriage secret for over a decade now. <laughs> in an unusual appearance in the Wall Street Journal's All Things Digital Conference in 2007, Jobs and Gates' mutual respect was apparent. There were too many people at Apple and in the Apple ecosystem playing the game of, for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. And it was clear that you didn't have to play that game, because Apple wasn't going to beat Microsoft. Apple didn't have to beat Microsoft. Apple had to remember who Apple was, because it had forgotten who Apple was. Once back at Apple, Jobs' characteristic flair for marketing came back in full force. 
Ken Siegel worked with Jobs on a breakthrough advertising campaign that defined their new direction. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. You're looking for that thing that could crystallize what's different about Apple? Ideas are flying back and forth. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I think at some point, the words think different appeared, and suddenly they were like, well, that's kind of magical. That strikes a chord. Think different became the line that launched Apple's rebirth. Steve was aware of every detail. I mean, literally every word, every image. Working with different companies, working with, you know, Intel, Dell, IBM, companies like that. You don't get that sense. I mean, you know, the, the top guy in one of those companies is not going to know about the, you know, the third paragraph of copy and the ad that's running in Newsweek that week. Steve did. One of the reasons why I thought the words were so perfect is I think you literally could have hung a sign that said Think Different in the garage when Wozniak and Jobs created their company. It would have been appropriate then, you know, as it is today. And I always thought that that advertising campaign really wasn't directed to the general public. It was really aimed at the people inside of Apple Computer. And it was Think Different. Let's not do what everybody else is doing. Let's not mimic Microsoft. Let's not chase IBM. The only way we're going to carve out a special place for our company is to think different and express that in Jobs was back at Apple Computer, but the company was still in trouble and needed a lot more than the morale boost that came with the return of its founder. It needed a hit product. Jobs turned to industrial designer Jonathan Ive, who in this rare interview with the BBC talked about how he redesigned what had become a boring beige box. A lot of people at that point in time were nervous around, around computers, around technology. Um, so, so a clear goal was you know, how we can make, um, you know, make, make the product accessible and not intimidating. How we can make it just so simple to use. As creative director at the advertising agency Chiat Day, Ken Siegel was one of the first to see the mysterious new product. We knew that something was coming and that it would be very special. So, you know, one day the team went up there and we sat in a room and there was a thing sitting on the table under a gray, you know, cloth of some sort. And, uh, you know, a little introduction and here it is. There was a, you know, kind of a gasp from around the room because keep in mind that no computer had ever looked anything like that. It was transparent. You could see the guts of it. You know, it looked like it came out of the Jetsons or something. The iMac was an astounding success. The thing was the biggest selling computer of all time. Six million units sold. And it really sort of set the stage for Apple's comeback. If that hadn't been a hit, Apple and Steve Jobs would be history. It gave them enough money and enough momentum, you know, to start coming out with other products. Slowly, Apple's fortunes began to change. The wins at the beginning aren't big wins, they're small wins. It's just, at the beginning, it's stopping the decline. When you start going sideways as opposed to continuing the decline, that's a bit of a victory. In an era of product research, Steve Jobs is a one-man focus group. They do zero marketing, zero, zippo. There's a famous Henry Ford quote, if he had asked people what they wanted, he would have built them a faster horse. A lot of companies cre you know, try to figure out what people want and then build that, and Apple doesn't do that. He doesn't listen to his customers at all. That's the last person he's going to listen to. They're knuckleheads. They haven't got a clue what they want because they've never seen it. You know, he's inventing this stuff before anyone's seen anything like it. In 2000, Jobs dropped the interim title and became permanent CEO of Apple Computer. Soon after, he saw the future. And it was not a personal computer. This is the best thing I think we've ever done. In October 2001, Jobs unveiled something that even for Apple was groundbreaking. The iPod went from concept to market in about eight months. But the iPod itself was only one part of a much bigger plan. I think the genius of the iPod was iTunes, not iPod. Jobs was going after a music business under siege by piracy and file sharing. Uh, the introduction of Napster and things that came after Napster is pretty much can be looked at as the tipping point when revenue started to fall. 
Larry Kenswill and other music executives were called up to Apple's Cupertino offices to negotiate terms that would define the future of the music industry. The negotiation was classic Steve Jobs. He simply said, if I can't sell it for 99 cents on my store, I am not selling it. That's it. No discussion. The music industry had few other options. In business, you're used to a lot of give and take. That's not Apple's way. Apple's way is they get what they want. It seemed like a good deal at the time, until iTunes became available on Windows as well as Macs. The record industry then realized just who had a bigger hit. A complete uh, monopoly at retail online. Both Apple and the music business have come out ahead because of Apple's uh, entry. But Apple has made a whole lot more money because they're selling hardware for hundreds of dollars and the music business is selling 99 cent products. Since they were unveiled in October of 2001, over a quarter of a billion iPods have been sold. Tony Saganagi is senior research analyst at Sanford C. Bernstein and Company. Starting in 2003, 2004, we started to see real volumes in the iPod. That was really when Wall Street, the stock price, um, started to move. The company started growing again, started innovating again. On May 15, 2001, Jobs unveiled an entirely new way to bring his products to consumers. And they, behind the scenes, for nine months, you know, built a series of prototype stores until they figured out the format they wanted. The Apple stores began to show staggering success. We had 26 million visitors during the holiday quarter in our retail stores. I mean, think about it. This is more people than live in any state in our union but California. Well, they're unbelievable profit machines. The company's product launches became huge events. Anticipation and speculation grew to a fever pitch with every new product, much of it due to the showmanship of its leader. Good morning and welcome to Map World. We've got a lot of great stuff for you today. He likes being the center of attention. He likes running the show. He's a big rehearser. Being a hippie, you wouldn't guess it. You would say, oh, he goes up and wings it. Forget it. There is nothing winged here. We went into the holiday quarter with the best lineup of music players on the planet. If you're an Apple product manager and Steve is going to introduce your product, the prior three months to that day, your life is hell. And you know it's only going to be 10 seconds. <laughs> but that 10 seconds, you're going to pay, you're going to sweat blood for those 10 seconds. It's the new iPod Max. It's a perfect match because he's a showman who can really introduce a product, and he has great products to introduce. You can be a great showman have a piece of crap and fail. You could also have a great product and be a lousy show person and also fail. He's both. He's got the engineering behind him and he's got the, the ability to do it. We believe that the personal computer is undergoing a rapid evolution to be the center of our digital lives and we have never been more excited about this. Stuff. Jobs' signature approach is known as the reality distortion field. You just want to believe everything the man says. It's an incredible talent he has for getting people to hear what he says and, and get excited about it. The reality distortion field is when he's in this sort of Svengali role where he says, and it only costs $1,800, and people applaud. And when they get home, they say, yeah, but the computer that I have now costs $900. Why is it good that it only costs $1,800? And worse still, why did I buy one on the way out? You're not talking about numbers. You're not talking about, you know, anything rational. You're talking about emotion. In the summer of 2004, Apple Computer was thriving, but its leader was not. Just over a month after he appeared on stage at this Apple event, Jobs sent a shocking email to his employees. He revealed he had been diagnosed with what he said was a treatable form of pancreatic cancer. He wrote that he underwent successful surgery for the deadly disease and expected a full recovery. When he returned to work a month later, questions remained about what his mysterious illness would mean for Apple's future.
In 2007, after a frightening health scare, Steve Jobs was back on stage for one of the most important launches in Apple's history. It was a product Apple had been secretly developing for years. It's a revolutionary mobile phone. iPhone, uh, who would have thought, huh? Somebody had said to me, Apple's going to just take over the smartphone segment and it's going to do it with a phone that, you know, 20% of the time is going to drop your call and it's never going to last a day. I would have said, wow, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> but they did it. There was so much buzz about that. That was estimated to be worth $400 million. That's all you could read about from October to, through to January. But there wasn't a, a goat farmer in Afghanistan that hadn't heard about the iPhone. Steve, I love you! No one had any idea that Apple was going to change the game in the way that it did once again with the iPhone. It was far more than a phone. This is handheld computing. In the midst of all the success, Jobs had to handle a federal investigation regarding irregularities in granting stock options. He apologized to shareholders after an investigation found that he had been aware of backdating the options. The lawsuit was settled when Jobs and Apple executives agreed to a $14 million settlement. Two Apple executives were indicted, but Jobs escaped unscathed. Then, at an iPhone event in June of 2008, Jobs' appearance had dramatically changed. He was noticeably thinner and frail. Speculation spread that the cancer he was treated for four years earlier had returned. Apple simply said his appearance was the result of a common bug. And on October 14th, Jobs jokingly shrugged off the rumors. But then, for the first time since he came back to Apple, the company announced that Jobs would not appear at Macworld. In less than three weeks' time, with the mainstream media and blogosphere in a swirl about his condition, Jobs publicly released a letter to Apple employees that said his continued weight loss was the result of a hormone imbalance. Just nine days after that, on January 14th, he finally said his health problems were more complex and announced a medical leave of absence. Day-to-day -day operations were turned over to Apple's chief operating officer, Tim Cook. One of the few, if not the only, bum rap that Apple has among investors is that they are secretive and they are not as communicative as other companies. On Steve Jobs' health, um, investors feel we own the company. We ought to know if the leader of this company has a risk of not being able to continue to lead it or may only be able to lead it in diminished capacity. Four months later on June 20th, Apple leaked the stunning news that Jobs received a liver transplant in Memphis, Tennessee. In September 2009, he returned in his trademark outfit to his familiar mark on stage. As some of you may know, about five months ago, I had a liver transplant. So I now have the liver of a mid 20s person who died in a car crash and was generous enough to donate their organs. And I wouldn't be here without such generosity. I'm vertical. I'm back at Apple, loving every day of it. State Senator. Jobs has since admitted he nearly died waiting for a liver transplant and has become a public advocate for organ donation. I was almost one of the ones that died waiting for a liver in California last year. I was receiving great care here at Stanford. Um, but there were simply not enough livers in California to go around. Not even a dreadful illness could sideline the recovering jobs from another insanely hyped product launch. In 2010, he revealed yet another device with his typically less than subtle script. It's phenomenal, fantastic. It's the best device I've ever seen, and we'd like to show it to you today for the first time. And we call it the iPad. The post-PC era has begun, and Steve Jobs has already grabbed the lead. In a sign of the shifting tension between tech giants, a fierce battle is developing between Google and Apple. Google is moving into the mobile market. Sales of new phones with their Android operating system have surged past the iPhone. Despite all the cutthroat competition, Steve Jobs' place in history is secure.
Looking back at the 2005 Stanford graduation, Jobs gave what some now consider to be one of the best commencement addresses of all time. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Ever a child of the 60s, he signed off with words from a favorite source, the Whole Earth Catalog. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much. Steve Jobs today has reinvented music. Steve Jobs has reinvented the telephone. Steve Jobs will probably reinvent television. And you could say, well, what's the big deal? Anybody could have done the Macintosh. Anybody could have done the iPhone. Anybody could have built in CD-ROMs into computers. Anybody could have put Firewire. Anybody could put USB. Anybody could create integrated graphics, fonts, you know. Anybody could have done any of this. The reality is nobody else did it. And so um, that, that's the genius of Steve Jobs. I think visionary is one of those words that gets abused, and particularly in Silicon Valley, when anyone wearing spectacles can be called a visionary. Steve is one of the very few people, I think there are probably only a handful of people in Silicon Valley since World War II, maybe you can count them on the fingers of one hand, who deserve that moniker. Steve is one.